so what I thought I would do is uh, you know just explain a little bit about what the major sort of theme of this discussion is uh, so as Nilotpil was mentioning uh, you know a number of companies that uh, we work with have extensive uh, you know links with various parts of the government right so whether it is you know directly the government or government agencies you know whatever form that they may be uh, and you know the increasing realization for many of these companies is that they need to be able to you know figure out ways to work with these different parts of the government right so that's generally the theme of the conversation uh, and we have uh, uh, you know four very experienced uh, professionals to uh, you know share their thoughts on uh, some of these uh, issues uh, you know I will very shortly jump into questions but I just wanted to you know provide some brief uh, background about myself and uh, you know our role so my name is Siddharth as uh, you know Lenotil mentioned and I work at Acumen and uh, you know we are a early stage investment fund uh, investing in many sectors and agriculture being one of them uh, and very recently uh, we wrote a report called Growing Prosperity uh, on Agriculture. I won't go into the details of the report. You can uh, download it from our website and you know, I'll make sure that uh, you, know, you have details of where to get that. Right. So that's sort of short context. Uh, I'll jump straight into uh, sort of uh, getting uh, perspectives from the panelists. So let me, let me just begin by you know, providing a very quick uh, you know, round of introductions for the panelists, uh, exactly sort of you know, 30 to 60 seconds about where you work, your name, and you know, a couple of lines about your organization. I'll start with Janesh. Hi, good afternoon, guys. Uh, my name is Janesh. Uh, I represent a fund called Omnivore Partners. Omnivore Partners is a, is a venture fund focused on making investments in early stage companies focused on food technologies and ag technologies companies. Uh, we've been investing for the last three years and have a small fund of $45 million for the sector. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Praveesh Sharma. I am a civil servant <coughs> and I work uh, as the head of an agency of the Ministry of Agriculture called the Small Farmers <coughs> Agribusiness Consortium. So our main task is to uh, create collectives and integrate farmers in value chains. Perhaps I'll share some of our experiences with that. Hi, my name is Tomo Nagasaki. I'm the impact team lead of Business Call to Action at the United Nations Development Program. Uh, PCTA is a public, publicly founded platform of inclusive businesses um, housed at the UNDP. Um, and just by uh, inclusive business, we mean uh, companies that include people who live on less than $8 a day on their core value chains as suppliers, distributors, employees. And we have companies uh, based across the globe, including India, uh, in different sectors and agriculture, power, energy, like that. Hi, good evening. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Prasanna Rao. I represent Arya Collateral Warehousing Services. We are a, a warehousing and a collateral management company. Uh, uh, we work with uh, various players across the value chain, primarily focus on small farmers, farmer organizations, and corporates. Uh, when I talk about the stakeholders in the value chain and what we intend to do and what we're trying to do on the field is to create size agnostic warehousing solutions which would add value to small small water farmers specifically. Great, thank you. Uh, so I'll start with you Prasanna. Uh, you know, given that you're an entrepreneur, work with all the players across uh, the value chain, uh, you know, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, how you as an entrepreneur have been working with government and what's been your experience, you know, what has worked well, what are the challenges, you know, could you please, uh, you know, bring out your perspectives on that front? Certainly. Um, the journey so far has been quite exciting, uh, moved from being a professional uh, to being an entrepreneur about four years ago. And uh, uh, I must really congratulate the team which has worked on that report on uh, the prosperity. In fact, it really summarizes the learnings and the experience that we as an organization have gone through. And uh, that's where, uh, you know, while, while I was just mentioning, 
that we work across when we when we work at the value chain we work across two parts of the value chain at one end there is the farmer and the farmer organization and the other end is the corporate and that's what our belief is that that's the most important gap that needs to be bridged uh, and and the interventions which would strive to do that would add a lot of value uh, in in value maximization at either of these two ends and that's what we've been uh, trying to do uh, over these last three three and a half years uh, in terms of the uh, challenges uh, and in, with respect to our interactions with the government uh, you know, I feel I could broadly divide that at two levels. One is in terms of the challenge at the government's end to be able to, uh, in a way, balance the objective of food security uh, and that of market-oriented agriculture development. Now, these are two objectives that government really works uh, on, and there are a lot of intentions which which have been shown and exhibited over the past few years. While there have been intentions on either of these sides, actions have been sort of biased towards the former, which is which is food security, and that's what I feel as an entrepreneur working uh, 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 on value maximization is one of the greatest challenges that we've encountered, and so as the stakeholders for whom or with whom we work are encountering. And uh, you know, just just to uh, elaborate, uh, you know, for example. One of our proposals is with a state government, which is primarily a paddy producing state. Now, there are a lot of incentives, a lot of support which is available for warehousing in terms of warehouses built for paddy. Now, the state also has a large competitive advantage, so far as maize, cashew, and a few other cash crops are concerned. Unfortunately, these geographies are slightly divided. So there's there's one part which produces paddy and there's one part which produces maize and other cash crops. Now, our proposal to the government was that we would set up a significant amount of warehousing space which would leverage on this competitive advantage in the state so that the smallholder farmers specifically, because those parts do not get the benefit of the paddy program and the MSP program of the government, could benefit. And because it is competitively there, that there are corporations with whom we work who are interested to procure from, from the very state. But the issue is that the government somewhere has not been able to take a decision to really support the, 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 the market-oriented uh, 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 approach on agriculture. Now, and that's where I thought that, you know, I, and that's where I feel that the dichotomy really exists and some support and some intervention, so far as that is concerned, is very, very important. And at the end of it, what happens? The farmer who produces paddy gets benefit only to the extent of the MSP. And we all know that normal paddy, the returns that accrue to the farmer are very, very limited. On the other hand, where there is a competitive advantage of the state, so for as maize or any other crop is concerned, those farmers are not getting that benefit just because there's not enough infrastructure which will attract players, corporations to come in and procure from that particular state. And that's where I feel that this is only one instance. I'm sure in our experiences we would have many more uh, like that. So this one one particular uh, you know sort of a uh, complexity that that really exists, and that's what we've seen very challenging when we go into the state, work with the government to see how do we ensure that value maximization and competitiveness is is actually the objective, rather than looking at you know the, the whole entire era of subsidy and MSP and, and that. On the other side, there's the certain issues of inconsistency in policies. That's the other piece that, that, that we see. Uh, Mr. Sharma is right here, and I think he and his organization have done pioneering work in terms of promoting producer organizations. And we all know that that is one institution that really ensures and provides a huge leverage. So far as improving the bargaining power of farmers is, is concerned. But if you see the, the, the inconsistency in policy, that's really appalling sometimes. That, for example, if uh, a bank needs to lend to a, uh, an FPO on, on, uh, on warehouse receipts, for example, that loan is not classified under direct agriculture, which, which really does not uh, provide enough incentive for the bank to really do it. But if the loan is given to a farmer individually, it is classified under direct agriculture. Now, the whole purpose of having an FPO then gets, you know, in, in a way, uh, uh, impedes the whole growth of that organization. Similarly, 
Uh, there are state warehousing corporations which provide subsidized rentals to farmers directly. Uh, for example, in the state of Maharashtra, a farmer, if he stores a produce, he would pay 2 rupees 75 paise per bag per month. But if an FP is 75 paise per bag per month. And then, then how, how do you ensure that the FPO becomes an effective organization? Uh, these are just few instances. For example, I mean, we've been working with certain FPOs who have a huge challenge in terms of obtaining a <coughs> Mandi license, which is required to procure commodities from their own farmers, where the capital requirement is a crore of rupees. We're talking about a farmer organization. And how do we expect that the farmer organization would have a capital base of a crore of rupees? I'm sure and, uh, you know, we as professionals having worked eight, nine years or 10, 12 years in the industry, after that, when we started our organization, we really struggled to get out, uh, you know, get about a crore of rupees as capital into our own company. Now, these are certain instances which really, you know, which, which, which uh, you know, look at our faces and say that, okay, there is some bit of an inconsistency where there are intentions and there's a little bit of a gap on that. On the other side, so this is at, at the stakeholder level. Similarly, at, at our level, when we look at the policy inconsistencies, you know, there have been uh, instances where uh, 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 till a couple of years ago, a little less than a couple of years ago, there was a subsidy which was available from Nabat under the Gramin Bhandara Mojana to, to construct warehouses in different locations. Suddenly, this was this was stopped. Uh, in a little bit of time, it was you know it was said that this would be available under the uh, agriculture marketing infrastructure scheme, which was then also abruptly closed within a few months. And after that, we really don't know what's happening. Now, these are certain things that really impact entrepreneurs like us who work with a certain strategy to go around. And, and the result is, you know, one of the part that that I really take it, take as a learning is that, as you very rightly mentioned in, in, in your report. That it's a system, it's an ecosystem in which a market system in which we operate. So what we really do is that it's just like a you know, symphony. So there are different uh, bands and different instruments playing uh, you know, that make the symphony. So if you realize that the government being one of those parts, it's not really uh, you know, providing the kind of support that you need. So what you would do is you would mute that up and then probably work with other players in, in that system. So that's what we've really tried to do, to say that, okay, Probably these are certain aspects where the government should have done something, or probably there would have been a little more of, of a proactive uh, approach which would resolve some of these issues that I spoke about. What we would do is then, okay, there are other players, there are donors, there are multilaterals, there are uh, you know, impact investors, there are other debt providers, uh, there are FPOs, there are sponsors of FPOs. Now you would play along with them, and that's how we've been able to develop a model which really talks about how to be size agnostic when we talk to FPOs. I really cannot have a 5,000 tonner warehouse uh, at a location which does not exist without the kind of support that one may uh, like to have. So what really we need to do and what we've done is to say that maybe a 600 square foot shop with a shutter would act as a warehouse and, and not a uh, 5,000 tonner uh, uh, real huge mega structure with 10 different doors and trucks coming in would serve the purpose. So that's how we've been able to manage that. But this is the, the, the dichotomy that really uh, you know, bugs us while we, while we talk about the government, our interactions with the government. Thanks, Prasanna. There are some very interesting points you make, and you know, I definitely come back to you know a couple of the points you made. Uh, but I wanted to catch Janesh first. Uh, Janesh, you're an investor who's you know built a fund that's solely focused on agribusiness, agriculture, agricultural technology. Uh, how do you as an investor, while evaluating these enterprises as well as working with the companies you've invested in, uh, you know, how do you sort of look at the role of the government interaction of these companies? And what are the major learnings that you have from you know, the three years of investing that you've done in these companies? Sure, well, Sid, well, thanks for the question, right? I mean, when we look at making investments, we look like a normal investor saying, guys, can this company scale up fast? Can can this really transform what, what they're attempting to do it, right? And can in the next few years be a leader in the position, leader in the market where we are targeting? So that's a way a typical investor looks around, right? So we look at the transformative technologies where the entrepreneur does it, right? I mean, 
every business, whether it's cow, I mean, whether it's agriculture, non-agriculture, regulation has its own impediments. I mean, regulation is there for protection. Sometimes it feels that it's against us, but I mean, it is there. It is. I mean, there is one thing which I can't do anything. So we take with that and saying, guys, let's let's work around the system, right? We we need to play within the books of the laws. At the same time, government, I mean, there are enough options available. So and I think it's more often than not the entrepreneurs find the answers in the right way, right? Like what Prasanna said that I mean, it's, he looks at interrupt government, looks at donors or some other people to help him out. So we look at the same thing. Our experience with government has been not been. It's, it's a great experience up till now, right? I mean, we we always think that uh, government is a huge stakeholder in the ag sector. I mean, uh, more often than not, my portfolio companies are working with indirectly with the government, working on the subsidy regime, <coughs> trying to get farmers buy out of technologies, use the university's extension services. Uh, Navards helping a lot. Sometimes it will helps us. So I think there is a huge support, right? I mean. Well, is one way to look at saying government is always negative. I mean, that's that's every every intellectual guy in this country wants to pass <laughs> for every reason possible, right? I mean, and it's true true for most of the times, right? Government has its own shortcomings, but it's a government trying to settle problems of one point three billion people. It's not not going to be easy, anyone, right? I mean, so we just don't worry about what government does. I mean, we look at the books saying this is the rule of the law. Let's play with that. Government gives us so much of flexibility. I mean, you. I mean, you can work outside the system. You can work with private sectors. You are allowed to do contract farming. I mean, government gives you enough windows for doing things. So, we generally don't tend to bash with government. Uh, state governments have been fairly useful. Some more, than others less. Uh, so that's how we go about it. So not bad experience up till now. Sometimes we get stuck, but I mean, there's always a room open for something else to do. On. Yeah. Thanks, Janish. Uh, I'm going to come to Tomo. Uh, from your experience, you know, can you share some, uh, you know, examples of companies in agriculture, you know, that have, you know, either in India or elsewhere in other markets that have been able to, you know, build a good sort of link with government or government agencies, and you know, just so that we can, you know, benefit from your experience on that front. Sure. Thank. Thank you. So, um, before getting into the successful partnerships that we have seen in our uh, membership companies of BCTA. I just wanted to kind of lay out some of the challenges that we have heard from our members that are working in agriculture globally. Um, so, and you know, indeed, you know, our research does show that you know a lot of the companies in this sector uh, face a number of challenges. And for example, you know, access to finance is an obvious challenge for a lot of the smallholder farmers. And a recent study has shown that out of the world's 450 million smallholders. You know, which represents a large share of the global value, value chain, only 3% is being um, served by the traditional banking systems. And also for agri-based companies, you know, it could be uh, difficult for them to secure the necessary investment and funding to you know, set up agricultural facilities you know, such as processing plants. Inadequate infrastructure is also a problem, obviously, because for farmers who are based in remote areas, this means that they, are, they have difficulties getting their uh, products to markets and obtaining ag agricultural inputs. And this typically means that these farmers will have to pay higher prices for these inputs, which will reduce their profits. Sorry. Lack of access to market information is also a challenge um, for smallholders in accessing up-to-date information on market prices of their products, uh, weather forecasts, modern production and marketing practices that are all important. And you know this typically results in lower crop yields and higher levels of crop wastage. And finally, lack of training and skills of farmers themselves is another major challenge. Many farmers lack awareness of up-to-date modern cultivation techniques and basic business skills such as accounting and cash flow management and OD things. This is particularly difficult as most smallholders tend to have little formal education nor the resources that enable them to obtain these trainings. So given these challenges, how do our BCTM member companies are tackling these challenges? And you know, we have heard from our members that they tend to take a combination of different approaches to tackle these, you know, including provision of supplier financing and training to smallholder farmers that they're sourcing goods from, or investing in logistics and storage, for example. Um, and 
partnering with government is also an approach um, that has worked for some of our companies. So I just wanted to give you some examples. Um, so one company based in Cameroon called Noha, which is an established cocoa farmer, has undertaken a major initiative to build a cocoa processing plant in the country, which would be one of the largest facilities in Cameroon. And this project received the support of the government to develop the sector in terms of both ensuring the quantity and quality of the product. So for the farmers, there has been a pressure to improve the quality of their crops because um, you know, the company wants to grow the market, but the Cameroon, Cameroonian you know, produced cocos have not been, um, has, doesn't have the international reputation you know, for having a high quality cocoa. So this and the quality issue uh, stems in part from the fact that the crop is harvested during the rainy season, when farmers, um, you know, don't have enough cash in hand to invest in proper dry, drying equipment. So instead of these in, using these proper facilities, the farmers, you know, use ovens, which reduce the quality and productivity of their, you know, crops. So to resolve the issue of quantity and quality, NOHA. Um, so has signed an agreement with the government to receive assistance for financing the equipment that they're building now and will also work with uh, international and national organizations to train farmers in meeting international quality standards and developing new cocoa plantation. Another example is Samazon, which is a U.S.-based food company that trains community in the Amazon region in Brazil on organic and environmentally responsible production and harvesting of a side fruit. The company sources a side fruit from small-scale suppliers in the Amazon region uh, who participate in an organic and fair trade certification. And the company collaborates here with uh, local government institutions of Brazil to implement the training programs and facilitate the courses. And because company deals with um, native communities that live in the region, it is very important for them to have the buy-in from the government so that they won't fall into any types of troubles. Uh, lastly, uh, there's another example from the cocoa sector, but in a different country, uh, Ghana. So Mondela International, a global food business company, has this initiative called Cocoa Life, um, which aims to improve the economic, social, and environmental conditions of around a million cocoa farmers and their communities in Ghana, India, and other countries in Asia. And under this initiative, the company has partnered with the government to tackle the challenges of inadequate uh, infrastructure um, by constructing feeder roads in cocoa growing art areas to facilitate easy access uh, to markets for farmers and reduce the burden of transporting goods uh, over long distances. So this partnership has expanded to close to 500 communities as of date and through this partnership um, with the government, the company has helped cocoa farmers increase their, their yields which have translated into uh, increased income. So these are some of the examples that we have seen from BCT and other portfolios. Thanks, Tomo. That's very helpful. Uh, I just want to go to Pravesh now. Uh, as someone who's worked, uh, you know, from the government but extensively with agribusiness companies in the private sector, you know, what advice would you give to members in the audience who are, you know, social entrepreneurs working in agriculture and would like, you know, to be part, you know, to be participating in more government programs. You know, what would you say are the things that you know, they should do differently or what would you, you know, recommend uh, as advice to these uh, entrepreneurs? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, first of all, let me uh, say that I'm not representing the government here. Do I work for the government? <laughs> you heard the government leaders in the morning and I'm sure you absorbed their lecture. So I'm not Um, I'd like to place this entire discussion and uh, especially the views which, you know, expressed by Prasanna and Janesh um, in, in a sort of framework which I used to look at uh, challenges in agriculture and I divide this into three parts. So if you look at the challenges in agriculture and of course related agribusiness from the point of view of the institutions, the incentives and the investments. So I call them the 3i of agriculture. 
whether you are the government or you are a private sector company or you are a farmer or you are uh, an entrepreneur you are inevitably going to have to engage with each of these three verticals if you may i may use a corporate term now given the very unique context of our agriculture which uh, siddharth mentioned or somebody mentioned 1.3 billion people i think jinesh mentioned um there is no other country in the world where the challenge of finding livelihoods for such a large number of people rests on the agriculture sector there are more than 600 million people for indian 60 crore people who are still dependent on agriculture right that's 140 million households that's the largest number anywhere in the world china has moved more people out of agriculture so they are dealing with a far lesser number now and while we have the largest number of households still trying to get a livelihood out of agriculture you also have only around 13% of the gdp which they are sharing right so there's a world bank study of 2009 which calculated that in 2009 us dollar terms the average per capita contribution of an agricultural worker to the national gdp is around 600 dollars per annum while the per capita contribution of a non agricultural worker which i believe includes everyone in this room is around 2400 dollars per annum so there is this one is to four gap and that's not the bad news the bad news is that this gap is diverging so another 5 7 years time you and me who contribute 2400 dollars per capita in 2009 dollar terms will end up contributing close to around 3000 or 3200 dollars while the guys at 600 will possibly move to around 650 or 670 so that's a real recipe for social imbalance conflict uh, it's a, a challenge which i believe is not a challenge which the government alone can face so now this is the context as i said which defines our discussion while this is one reality the other reality is that in the last decade a little over a decade three fourths of the agricultural gdp has shifted from cereals and staples to high value agriculture which means that for every 100 rupees of the agriculture gdp 75 rupees is contributed by horticulture poultry dairy meat products fishery products and the government is not a major player in any of these value chains it's basically the private sector so as consumer demand changed as the middle class grew and as you know the demand for uh, diversifying the food basket emerged private sector agents including many of the gentlemen on this side and many of you on that side basically conveyed these signals to farmers and farmers shifted so if today 3/4 of the agri gdp is coming from non cereals and staples that means so we paddy oil seeds pulses is squeezed into this 1/4 segment and 3/4 is this high value segment now given that this is going to further accelerate is this a problem is is it a challenge or is it an opportunity and i would say it's a combination of all three and i would come back to my three pillars and say so that we will have to address each of these three to be responsive to this changing market dynamic if we are going to be able to uh, satisfy the livelihood needs of these 140 140 million households in the in an ideal world perhaps 30% of these households should not be in agriculture at all but where can you shift them we are not likely to see even in the next decade assuming that all the current initiatives make in india and the rest of it they succeed it will still be a decade before we are able to significantly shift you know a large uh, section of the rural population into manufacturing or services so for the next i would say very conservatively two decades people who are interested in agriculture as Uh, an area of economic activity as an area of uh, uh, social stress of potential conflict will have to look for solutions for 
better and more responsive institutions, better incentives, better targeting of the incentives, uh, Prasanna mentioned. Now that's a classic example that you are perhaps allocating your incentives inefficiently or inappropriately, which is preventing people from uh, leveraging what are known solutions. So it's accepted that given the fact that 85% of our holdings are now small or marginal, the only way forward is to collectivize the producers. We cannot find legal solutions to consolidate the land base, but we can certainly consolidate the producers. And it's showing good results in some parts, but I would say it's far below potential. I went to France last year and I was astounded. There are only four lakh farmers in the entire country, but every farmer in France has to be a member of a cooperative. And that gives them the entire you know, access to an ecosystem which involves credit, technology, markets, the rest of it. Um, it would seem that given the numbers in agriculture uh, and given democratic compulsions, some of these very obvious and sensible solutions would be in place by now. But as you would know, uh, economics is trumped by politics. So that's why the term political economy was coined. And strangely enough, it was not coined in our country, it was coined in America. So the, our understanding of political economy largely comes from the work which has happened in America. That will tell you that numbers are uh, irrelevant, but it's actually the, um, the, shall I say, power of capital which will determine which way policy will go. So um, I, in my, you know, 32 years in the government, I've spent 18 in agriculture, so please forgive a crusty old dog to you know, <laughs> bore you with some of these details. Um, what's happening is a very interesting clash between what I, what I call rural commercial capital, which is the older form of capital, the old money lender, the big landlord, the big traders in the rural sector, and what I would call all the you know bright folks in this room, the modern financial capital. So it's a clash between RCC versus MFC. So you can see there are, there are these three major waves when the government tries to sort of suppress RCC, the first wave of land reform, which ended up being uh, incomplete because the power of the rural capital at that time was so much that they could buy political patronage and more or less uh, bring the whole land reform process to a halt. The government then came up with the idea of starting cooperatives. Don't forget, cooperatives are as old as the late 50s. It's not a new idea. The producer company that we are not trying to promote is basically a newer, new age version of the cooperative. So the cooperative came, but was in about a decade's time captured by the rural elites and subverted to their purposes. So this second wave also subsided. The third wave came with bank nationalization in the 70s when the government forced the banks to open rural branches and push capital through schemes like IRDP, some of you uh, may recall, maybe from your uh, college readings. Now, these three waves more or less you know, floundered at the shore. They could really not push rural commercial capital back. But what seems to have changed the dynamic is our post-91 <coughs> scenario, when we were forced to globalize and integrate with the world market, when world market prices started influencing local commodity uh, prices. Now all this is going to sound uh, you know, a bit uh, of an information overload and maybe too much of a uh, capsule, but I'll try to uh, sum this up in the next minute or so. See, going forward, our agriculture has to have three goals. It has to be ecologically sustainable. We cannot have 600 million people surviving on this natural resource endowment. Right, So there have to be things like skilling to quickly move people out. Uh, and when I speak to audiences like this, and I say that, look, skilling is today perhaps one of the most important agricultural investments that one could make. It sounds like a contradiction in term. What does skilling have to do with agriculture? And I'm not talking about skilling of people in agriculture. I'm saying um, some of the people who turn up sometimes in our office to deliver a you know, package, and they are first generation migrants from a village somewhere in North or Eastern India. Uh, many of them have difficulty reading the address, which is in English, okay? And 
finding the location. So they'll call three or four times, and I'm sure the company doesn't pay for their mobile phone. But look at the level of skill that all that you are required to do is to read a label and to find an address. And for that, you need to consult somebody on the phone three or four times. Now, can people who are coming to the cities, the next generation of farmers, children, be educated or skilled enough to take the lowest rung of service sector jobs in the city? That's going to impact agriculture. That is, I think, an area where I would look for investment. So this ecological sustainability is going to be a challenge for us. The world is going to pressurize us to reduce greenhouse gases. The bulk of our greenhouse gases uh, today come out of our agricultural sector. There is pressure that we should reduce our paddy area. Let me not go into too much detail. The second um, challenge before us is going to be in this scenario of pressure of population and the markets, how do you keep your agriculture competitive for uh, most of our history, most of our crops have been globally competitive, but the government for reasons of food security which were referred to has kept the market closed. So our farmer cannot benefit from high world prices, but this is changing now. The world is able to produce food at industrial scale technologies and bring the costs down and our farmers are not going to be able to compete. So what are we going to do with them? And the third challenge is that our agriculture, as I said, for the next two decades, decades at least, will have to be socially inclusive. We cannot see the kind of technologies that you see uh, on film, uh, a combined harvester in North America or Western Europe, where one farmer is able to take care of 50 hectares of land. The technology today enables one farmer to take care of the entire needs of 50 hectares of land. Our farmers with available technology can barely do five. Okay, but this labor intensive agriculture also enables people to remain on the farm and okay, uh, earn a subsistence level wage. The challenge is going to be do we, uh, do we change fast enough or do we change so fast as to displace many of these people? Uh, are they going to end up in urban slums? Are they going to contribute to social conflict? That's something to be thought of. In the end, if I want to see my institution vertical, my in incentive vertical and my uh, investment vertical really grow in the next, okay, let me just say 10 years. Um, I believe that government will have to perhaps work harder to catch up with the market. Today policy is behind the curve with the market. Markets are ahead. The government is not always entirely aware of many of the innovations taking place. Forums like this are extremely helpful, but I would think that uh, instead of um, a one sided talk or a lecture, and more continuous interaction if some of the experiences of that side have to flow into policy making. I'm going to stop here and I'm looking forward to maybe some questions from yours. Thank you. Thanks, Pravesh. Uh, on that note, why don't I open it up for questions? Uh, I'll take two or three questions at a time and assign it to members here. So there's a question there, please. Yeah, we'll take two, three questions. Yeah. Can you just state your name and organization as well? I'm Kapil Sukhita from Harium Biofoods in Rudrakur, Uttarakhand. Okay, fine. Any other questions? So comments, maybe? Question, maybe? We should hear some of the experiences in the. Hi, I'm Sandeep Marwani. I'm from the Delhi Dialogue Commission, which is from the Delhi government. I have a question to Mr. Ramesh. Uh, you spoke in the end uh, about the government being, uh, should be open to more ideas and perhaps uh, being more involved. Uh, could you could you list out a few things that the government should be doing in urban areas to help social innovators? Okay, uh, I'll take one more question before uh, I go to the panelists. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So this is also a question for Professor. I'm really popular. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, thank you very much for the very informative talk. Uh, 
And to reduce it, you know that what you said that about only 25 percent of the agricultural GDP comes from traditional agriculture, and everything all everything has been pushed into just the 25 percent. Now I believe that you know we are actually importing pulses now. India is importing pulses, and as our uh, uh, as our economy increases uh, or improves, and there is more consumption of uh, proteins, we are talking about helping. Skilling agriculturists to help them exit the trade, but then we also need to think about how to keep them interested in agriculture because we need to correct that 25, 75 percent in some way and be self-sustainable. Right. So That's right. What do you do, please? I work for Intelica. Could anybody force you to work for Intelica? No. Why should you force a person to do farming? No, I'm not saying force. How to keep them interested? Because it's probably in the why should I? Why should I? You know, keep them interested if they are not interested. If the incentives available to you were so obvious to you that you came and worked in a city in a company like Intelligal, I believe that a farmer or his son or his daughter are equally competent to decide for themselves. The latest survey says 46% of all farmers want to leave agriculture. What's the great surprise? Please go and spend one full day on a farm. It's awful. It's it's really really stressful. So I mean I'm, I I always see think that maybe the government has to suppress these figures, you know, to prevent sort of social panic. Oh my God, seventy percent people want to leave the farm and turn up in the cities. So it's only forty six percent is reported. But I think it's quite obvious that if it's not a remunerative activity, why should we force people to stay there? As a society, as a country, and certainly I think. the primary responsibility lies with the government you have to create alternative sort of options for those people if i had my way which i will not not thank you very much i would like to see about a third of agricultural land go back to the forests that's what's going to improve agriculture that will lead to at least one third rise of our productivity and then i can see one third of the people leaving agriculture that's what's probably sustainable for this country it's not going to happen but since we are in a sort of wish and wish is sort of more i want to add few points right i mean uh, soil to interrupt on this go for it well, if you take a look at data 1990 70% of indians were related to agriculture today it's less than 43 percentage so every year on a, on a de- uh, statistic basis you're losing 1.25% of indians from agriculture to non agriculture Uh, which is truly a way how all economies in the world function, right? U.S. in 20s was like 40, 50 percent were U.S. citizens were agriculturists, right? It was less than two percentage, and that's the way India is going to go. It's it's not going to be any exception. I don't think is any so- sort of worry that if farmers do agriculture, we're going to reduce production. I mean, less farmers will produce more. That's the better option of doing things, right? I mean, you you need to bring technologies. Uh, I I know I I might not agree everything what Pravesh says about it, but there are enough technologies, a lot of innovation happening on small scale farm holding. I mean, if the world has made innovations for large farmers, India is taking a lead on making innovations for small scale holding. I mean, you talk about precision agriculture, mobile getting into farming, cloud computing, everything is being getting into farming. That farmers are getting information on their mobile phones. India is doing crop insurance for the first time in history, right? Both private and agriculture uh, uh, government institutions are working towards that. So there's a lot of development happening. We need to see one third of farmers get out of the farm and period. No matter what happens, right? And government will find out. If government can't find, private sector will find it. I mean, if there is investment, there is opportunity. People in this country are smart enough entrepreneurs to get the answers. I think expecting government to give all responses or getting all the solutions out. It's it's like stupidity, right? I mean, we all smart individuals. Why can't we just do it ourselves? I mean, government is like what we are. Sorry, I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's 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 so important too. Well, that's an important perspective. There was one question on yeah. agriculture and urban areas. Yeah, do you want to take? No, I think he was not talking about agriculture and urban areas. Rather, he was saying how do you sort of tap innovations. And I think uh, this dialogue commission is a great idea. We perhaps need more such institutional arrangements. So I talked about institutions. We perhaps do not have enough institutions to dialogue between society and the government. This is something we can look forward to, and I think it can be easily replicated for rural areas too. 
there is today no standing mechanism where we can get feedback from what's happening on the ground. So in our country, we've accepted that the person who speaks for the farmer is the guys you met in the morning, the politicians. But because of you know ideological, political, and other reasons, they may filter the information that uh, they give to you, right? Because each of them has to sustain a certain patronage network, etc. I don't want to get into that. Um, bottom line is, and I completely agree with you. I don't think there's any point of disagreement between the two of us. A huge amount of innovation certainly is taking place. Uh, the 70th round of the NSS survey, which is of the situation survey on farming, says that the single biggest source of technical advice to farmers today is not government extension agents, it's private sector input dealers. 19% of all farmers reported that they get technical advice from the input dealer, who's a private guy. Only 9% of farmers said that they get their advice from the government extension agent. So the market has provided the solutions, right? In the 60s, we had the TNV system, the you know training and visit, where government hired people who went to the villages and tried to you know transfer technology. But today, as he says, there are you know multiple channels, even in remote tribal districts of Madhya Pradesh or Chhattisgarh, farmers are aware of the price of major commodities in the nearest Monday. It's true. The SMS and other you know forms of communication have penetrated enough now they may not always be able to benefit from them that's another issue uh, and i think we need to find uh, ways to increase the incentives for them to be able to benefit from these value chains i i think that's uh, a point we can all agree on so i i i have one more point on the urban people contributing to agriculture i think urban people contribute a lot of waste which is which is can be used as manure, right? If 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 government allows entrepreneurs to use this waste, which in a city like Delhi you can get a couple of metric tons every day, I mean you can create a great amount of biomanure. I mean this can be used back in the in the farming and can be hugely ecologically sustainable. Um, so what's happening? It's happening. Few states in I mean in no, South. Delhi also is happening. Well, I don't, don't know about Delhi, but at least I've seen few few state governments allowing entrepreneurs to take the dump yards and say make a manual out of it. I mean, after five, ten years, it becomes a great garden place and the, the city is much better than what it was before. Hmm. Okay, here a factual question, I'll just settle in a minute. Uh, you see, our role is to act at the bottom of the value chain pyramid. So we don't work with big agribusiness. We typically support projects which have a uh, investment ceiling of five crores. So like in Rudhupur, we've done a lot of these IQF units which freeze P, peas and um, mango pulping plants and you know Krishna Gopal is here, we've done a lot of work in Andhra and <clears throat> the bottom line is that all these incentives uh, in fact are supposed to cover first stage risk but if you ask my honest opinion uh, I don't really think that they are the critical factor okay in either making a success or a failure of those investments if those units are working uh, the reasons are not the fact that we gave some little sweetener in the form of our venture capital. You know, uh, our venture capital actually should not be called venture capital. Uh, in your terminology, there is patient capital. So I call it our venture capital saintly capital. Because it is at 0% interest. We don't take, seek any return. And we just take back the uh, you know initial investment after 7 years. And if you imagine the loss of value in terms of inflation and the interest cost is the entrepreneur says, so basically it's free money. But we don't call it subsidy, we call it venture capital because we want to put a little pressure on him to return. But I would say, we've... Beg your pardon? A lot of people have lots of people knocking on your door now. Yeah, well, lots of people do knock on our doors, but many of them don't qualify. <laughs> because there's a little catch in our venture capital, which is, that unlike, you know, my neighbor here, um, the government's intention is that this money should leverage higher institutional investment. So our money is always given in tandem with the bank loan. So that's the spoiler for you, right? Uh, so we've supported about a thousand projects in the last five, six years, total investment of around 350 crores, but we've leveraged projects, the value of which is more than 4,000 crores. So we have like one is to 10 leverage. But if you ask me, I would rather not put that money there because um, it's a it's a wrong signal. Uh, this is another example of misallocation of incentives. 
some years ago the government thought the absence of cold storages in this country is one of the reasons for the high wastage there was a famous report i should not go to <laughs> which came out with some astounding figure of losses based on what nobody knows till today that 40% of all fresh produce is lost <laughs> there is no evidence to support that thesis any anyway, so the government in one of its acts of being responsive so here is a very respected private sector multinational saying that 40% of fresh produce is lost we must incentivize cold stores so the government started giving a very liberal subsidy on uh, cold stores and uh, you know climate controlled warehouses and you know today 98% of the produce which is held in these cold stores belongs to traders whether it's potato or it's other fresh produce the very high tech ca stores what are called climate uh, the controlled okay. atmosphere stores the bulk of them are located on the ports and they are used to import apple and kiwi from all over the world and play the market it is not possible to viably take kashmir apples from kashmir to chennai but it is possible to import apple from seattle to chennai and sell them all the way to kashmir that's value chain for you so here is a classic example of the government starting out of the right intentions but the incentives have worked against the producers so our producers of apple in himachal and jammu and kashmir are suffering because of the huge import of chinese and american or australian apples uh, and facilitated by these ca stores located at the ports 50% subsidy given by the government and it's my case thank you Let's take some more uh, comments and so questions. Some others also. They can also <laughs> feel involved. Right. Questions or comments or reactions. Come up with your field experience of uh, working with the producer collectives and what you see the role of the private sector. I'm sorry, I'm throwing a question back at the audience because that's the only way we take this over. Yeah. Uh, uh, let me ask uh, work with the producer organization. I think uh, where Prasanna Rao was also talking about uh, what kind of uh, scale agnostic kind of uh, storage go-downs and all this infrastructure being coming down. Uh, I think there's a lot of investment potential done, especially after the work of SFAC. Uh, more than 300, 400 such producer companies across the country have come across. But all of them suffer from investment uh, uh, capital. That's one of the I which I was trying to say. So, uh, how do we actually raise capital? And that's definitely not the uh, game for the most of the funds which are sitting here. They are not interested in that. So, how do you actually address this situation? Because they feel it is quite risky, which is fair enough that it's risky because it's an end organization and all these small producers, what kind of equity investment they bring in and how do you actually come down. So, there's some little bit of financial engineering that has to be done. to help these uh, entities to actually make investments is there any research going around is there any financial innovations that have been done to help these producer organizations to make the investments okay prashant are you want to take that or no i'm not why he spoke about i think uh, uh, wanted an answer from uh, you guys but, uh, <laughs> that, like, uh, you know one thing that uh, really you know we tried to do is to and that's what uh, really attracted us to that that thought is that it would be unfair to really expect an investment into infrastructure from any investor forget about you know why a venture fund or uh, you know an angel investor or whoever, whatever in this terms the idea is that as an investor it is natural that there has to be a return in sight okay as or probably it's saintly capital that's probably the <laughs> other end of it and i will leave that these are these are businesses which are viable okay. yeah so the idea is that the point that uh, you know that really drives us uh, you know and we've seen that that works to some extent at least in the pilots and some of the instances that we've tried it on is that there has to be a demonstration and the demonstration has to be strong so as to attract the investors there then be other way around so for example you know whether if it is it is say a warehouse or it is a cold storage or whatever that that structure is cold storage because there's a bit of a technicality involved amount of investments are higher on the warehousing side is what we have an experience and i'll just share a few examples uh, 
a produce, producer organization, what we've seen uh, in terms of, say, the ability to store starts with about you know, 100 tons uh, in, in, in the first day. That, that's what we've seen. Uh, 100 tons would mean about, uh, you know, from close to about 2,000 bags. Okay, so 2,000 bags is what with, is, 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 that is required to store. And if the demonstration is right, in the second year, this number goes up to about 350 to 500 tons. And it's nothing but pure economics. And, you know, and that's the only language that any institution, any individual would understand across the globe. Which is to say that if there is value maximization, anybody would be willing to participate in that innovation or in that structure. I think that's what was one of the points that was covered in the report as well. It's very, very natural. And what we've seen there is that if look at any any produce, and when we talk about the farmer, he's really at a you know, very, very advantageous position. A trader actually comes a little later in the value chain. That's why he has to speculate. But if you look at a farmer, he's actually insulated from speculation. He comes in at a level where uh, the price is really going down from the time of harvest is very, very minimal. And you, you look at look across here, unless there is, you know, like for example, what happened in Chile maybe a decade ago was that there was a report saying that there are carcin car carcinogenic substances in Indian chilies and the price is just shot down by around more than 40% in, in, a, in a single season. Leaving aside those exceptions, normally, if, if you deal with farmers, the, the possibility of a downside is very, very minimal. And what we've seen and what our pitch to a producer organization is that just look at at what rate you, 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 you actually harvest and sell. And imagine at what rate the trader who's purchased from you sells in about three months time or maybe four months time. And there are always early adapters who who, 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 who believe in trying this out. So what we need is actually a solution which, which demins, demonstrates this in, in the first year or maybe in a couple of seasons. And that's where you would find investments coming in. And let me tell you, for doing this, the investment isn't really large. I mean, I, 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 there, there is actually no investment. I mean, what exists is what we have to use. Say, for example, if there is a, 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 a shop which is there in the normal village market, which is a 500 square feet shop, and there are two adjacent shops like that, who says that we can't use that at so as storage? We may find probably there'll be few of those, but the advantage that we have today is first that there's an appreciation in the producer of producer community where they see that there is an upside which exists, which is not being enjoyed by them today. And the second advantage is that there are certain structures like this which are available. Now the idea is that to, to attract the investor, this needs to be shown and that's where the endeavor would be and that's what you know, our, uh, 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 that's what we strive to do when we work with producer organizations to say that don't really, it, it's really cliched to think that a warehouse means a large structure with those, you know, the tilted uh, uh, roofs and there are 10 different openings and a 5,000 metric ton or a 10,000 metric ton. What we need and what is available today, it may not be available for every FTO, but what we've seen uh, across is that there are options which are available. Maybe there are, you know, 300 square feet, there are three shops which are there. But what is required is that 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 needs to be used to prove the demonstration. And when we work with farmers, because of the levels at which they operate, the risk of downside is, I would say, I would not say it's absolutely zero, but it's lesser as compared to what a trader would, other, would otherwise face. So once you demonstrate, I think that's where it is fair to expect from an investor to really come in. And I'm sure, one thing that I would say, and it's only my assumption, that if you have a model which I'm not saying go across the, the country, work in 15 states and prove this. If it is something which is done in one particular state, maybe in a few blocks, and it is demonstrated well enough, I'm sure there would be investments which will come. So I think there are investments, I think, no, no, I think guys, you're not to, I mean, uh, you should also you're give us. We have promoted a producer cooperative 
which is 9 years old, which has a turnover of 65 crores, makes a surplus of 4 crores and in last 2 years, some of the producer companies that we have promoted have turnovers of 2 crores, 3 crores, making trade, they make made money also. This year we borrowed uh, 3 crores from uh, different sources to help. Investment is very high, huh? it's not that it's not high. I mean it requires money to do, do even if you want to trade with a trader. Because he gives the payment only after 30 days or 40 days, sometimes 25 days the time. Who is going to pay the producer during that time? I think you need to be slightly more creative, right? I mean, I mean, I think... That's the reason I'm telling you. Okay, there are financial, okay, so financial engines, guys like Shubham Logistics, a lot of warehousing companies being created across the country. It's outside in the private sector, FEOs can start working them, pay them rent and they are professional warehouse. You don't need to own the entire warehouse. It's it's happening across. Other thing is a technology innovation, right? Again, uh, I mean, let me say about the area of Intel, uh, which with whom we would like to work. Then we try to okay, let's let's let's, let's 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 hear him out. And I think I always look from a what we call the democratization of technology. I mean, we try about FPOs and everything is trying to bring individual people coming together, which is not a traditional trade of Indians. Indians are individualistic. I mean, they would want to own their piece of land. So that's the reason we have small, small acres of land, right? I mean, Pardon? I mean, I mean fair enough. I mean, I this have. This is a country of collective. People come together to do things. Okay, fair enough. Could be that. Okay, let's let's get beyond that point and focus more on. I'm trying to say is that it's a, it's a it's a democratization of technology, right? If you can bring technology, which is Indian farmer can use it profitably. I think there is a fair chance that he gets a solution. But I Dinesh, mean, in all I mean, sense, I will interrupt you. In all fairness, these are the guys in the field and we work with them. I would really endorse what they are saying there. And I would put the private sector finance at a second round. It's public sector finance which is failing. We set up a credit guarantee fund where we offer to cover 85% of the risk of a loan to an FPC. You know, in the last one year, I have been able to issue one cover note worth about 60 lakhs. Yeah, I felt embarrassed signing that. I said, look, surely you could have added a couple of zeros, you could have made six crores. So, uh, you're absolutely right uh, that half a dozen of these logistics uh, you know, service providers and collateral service providers, we organize a round table. And we thought we should uh, show the opportunity. The truth is that the kind of risk cover that and I'm not saying that's wrong, you know, the kind of risk cover that they are looking for and the kind of cost that they are dealing with, it just doesn't seem to match. No, I, I have an answer for that, right? I'm, I invest in a company called EcoZen, right, which makes a micro cold storage, which is for a farmer owning two or three acres of land, right? You are off grid, you don't require any electricity support, it works from cooling from 2 to 20 degrees, you can do pre cooling and you can store whenever you want. You are on your own, right? You are going to make it mobile, so if you are an entrepreneur, you put on a strap of a truck and go to the next farm where you want to store, right? You, the same micro coasters can be used for storing strawberries to leeches to mangoes to onions, potatoes. It's a technology innovation, right? It's not rocket science. The three IIT kids can make it, I think we need to work on technology which is going to democratize, not trying to wait for things to happen, guys. And if you do a micro cold storage, government of, I mean, MNR gives a support of 40% of cost. You do equipment finance of 40%, the farmer puts 10 20% of money, is sorted out, boss. It doesn't require too much of effort. Chinesh, but I think the question or the challenge no, that I is coming out. Saying, we are saying, that what I'm saying that if we can find a solution of a single farmer owning two acres of lawn, land, FUs are easier problem to solve it. You can solve it a smaller problem. So you should take up his optimism and <laughs> set up a... No, we are innovation. We are doing it, right? And we're seeing across... I mean, countries like Africa are using it better than India. I mean, innovation is happening in India, but people outside India are using it better. Okay, I'll, I'll let that conversation carry on offline. Uh, and I'll take one last set of questions because we have about you know five minutes to go. Uh, yes, madam. Uh, to stay, to do better, uh, to take better initiatives because policy in some sense is a driver for these guys to uh, keep doing what they're doing. Uh, no, thanks for that great question. So, 
I think we have a, we have discussed a lot of things on this table. I think we've discussed about the importance of demonstrating the value of the the agribusiness to get the funding coming into the business. We also discussed about you know also the challenges that these companies are operating under difficult regulatory requirements. You know, so how do how do as a company how do you um, you know, persuade the government to kind of work in favor of you because you ultimately you want to form a good partnership with local governments, whether you're in India or in other emerging markets. And one thing we have seen from our member company is that there, and also we have talked about the technology innovation that is available for these companies. So what he, what we have, what we are starting to see, what our companies are doing is that they're starting to collect data and using the data to make the case. Uh, to 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 make it as a tool to you know make make a strong case for the government to work in favor of you. So, for example, you know like if you feel that you know, I mean I cannot come up with an example, but here in the agribusiness and you feel that there is a regulation that is working, it, 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 that is impeding your business, then rather than just you know making a, a simple complaint, you know, start collecting the data, whatever that you can, you know, and then. Present it, you know, using an objective, you know, point of view, and because of the emergence of these mobile tools that are available right now, and our companies are also using a lot of, you know, data collection using Android phones, you know, deploying it to the field forces to collect a various data from customers, you know, about their field force operations, and so increasing a lot of data are becoming available about your market companies. So use that kind of evidence base. To make the case of your business, so that the government will, will you know, will ultimately work in favor. It's not going to be easy. It'll be a lot of iterative process. But we have, we are starting to see some of that regulatory changes happening in other sectors in different countries. So, yeah, if that answers your question. Thanks, Domo. On that uh, optimistic note, I'll uh, uh, end this conversation. But uh, the panelists will be around if you have any questions for them one on one. Thank you so much. Thanks for your uh, participation and thanks for your interesting questions. Yeah.